I want to welcome everybody here and those of you watching online, privileged to worship with you. Special shout out to Pastor Dan and Rhonda from South Dakota. We're praying for you guys. Come home quickly and soon. Can I get an amen for their return? Well, all week I had been praying over this weekend and kept hearing the same phrase over and over and over again. And this is the phrase that I kept hearing, time to get unstuck. Could you turn to somebody on your right and say, time for you to get unstuck? All right, turn to somebody else and say, I'm getting unstuck, though. If you're taking notes, write this down. The title of today's sermon is Get Unstuck, Moving from Wilderness to Canaan. All week I'd been praying, kept seeing this same picture roll through my mind and my heart. I saw an individual standing in a place in the middle. Now they weren't where they were, but they also weren't where they were trying to go either. And they were stuck in this place. And to their best attempts, they couldn't actually go back and they couldn't actually move forward. They would just, say it with me, stuck. So often, I think this describes our lives. We are, 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 are on a trajectory towards the promises of God, on a, on a way towards what we sense him saying to us, and, and, and life and things just happen, and we kind of just get very well. And, and in this place of stuckness, we try to do everything that we know to do, and sometimes we're just, and no matter what takes place, we're just... I believe the Lord today wants to unstick some folks in what can be, whether it be in a marriage, whether it be in a job or ministry or school endeavor or play, sometimes we're just stuck. I love the Cambridge Dictionary's definition of this. It says, unable to move from a particular position or unable to change a circumstance. I think both of those apply to this element of stuckness. Like let's, look, sometimes being stuck is a, is a, is a pattern of life or behaviors that we just want to get out of and we just can't seem to get out of that, right? The Apostle Paul would say, there's stuff that I don't want to do and I just keep doing it. And there are things that I don't want to do and I just keep doing it. And there's things that I don't want to do and I just keep doing it. And he seems to describe a life as sometimes that's just being stuck. Sometimes it's ways of thinking, processes and perspectives that we just, no matter what, we, no matter how hard we try, our mind just can't seem to get aligned with what God says about something. And, and, and it's not always sin. Sometimes we just get stuck in a rut. Like, like, like you are still surviving. You are still making it, but, but the passion is gone. The vision is no longer present. The, the desire to get up and get to that place is just, just gone. And you're stuck. I mean, you're, you're, you're forward moving a little bit, but it ain't fun. It's like the, it's like the tunnel shut down to one lane and you, you crawl in. It ain't fun. Cell reception don't work. Radio don't work. You just there in your thoughts and you're stuck. And yet, you know, it's part of the frustration of stuckness is you know there's somewhere you want to get to. It's not just that you're not moving. It's not just that you can't break free. It's, you know, there's something ahead. And yet it feels so very far away because you're stuck. I believe sometimes being stuck is just life. Somebody threw a piece of gum on the sidewalk. You didn't see it and you stepped on top of it. And you're going where you're going, but every time you walk, you hear on the bottom of your shoe. Like you're getting somewhere, it's just kind of annoying, right? Like sometimes that happens, That's, that sucks his life. And, and in those moments, if we just take a breath, as the, as the old heads would say, when I growing up, take a chill pill, just, 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 just take a moment, it will work itself out. Other times being stuck is God. Sometimes he sticks you in a place. He puts a restriction on you because there's something about being stuck that forms you that being unstuck doesn't. 
When, 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 when you are stuck in a place and it's a divine hand that is inhibiting something from moving around you. That, that there's a growth process because all kinds of stuff comes out of you when you stuck. Sometimes it's God. And, and other times it's not life, it's not God. It is the devil. We have one who has come to kill, steal, and destroy and to inhibit the plan of God and kingdom work in your life. Paul would say we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but what? Powers and principalities of the air. There is one who is trying to come and diminish and violently steal from your life the promises that God has spoken over you. That is true. And in that place, it's not just relaxing. It's not just asking, Holy Spirit, where are you forming me? In that place, it's an intercession. In that place, crowding the devil out that you get unstuck. But come on, there's a fourth reason. It ain't the devil. It ain't God. It ain't life. It's us. Come on, sometimes that enemy is in a me. Now, come on, that was clever. Help me out. Online, help me out with that. <laughs> sometimes the enemy is in a me, and I'm the reason why I'm stuck. God has delivered me from Egypt and enslavement. He's brought me to Sinai. He has covenanted with me. He's brought me across the wilderness, and I am standing at the edge of my Canaan. And the reason why I'm not there and here ain't because of the Canaanites, ain't because of Pharaoh, ain't because of God. It's because of me. A circumstance that rages around me that I don't respond well to, a place of formation that I haven't been willing to foster, now in that place of something taking happening around me, I can't respond well. It's just us. Our text for not today, but a text that illustrates this is in the book of Hebrews. Your unstuck Bibles have leather and pages if you want to pull those out. The writer of Hebrews here would say, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which is stuck so closely. I'm sorry, which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The writer here of Hebrews would use this word, uh, lay aside, and it means to put off and to throw away. The implication is not that this thing is clinging to you. The implication is that you have laid, laid hold of it. And it's put in a context of forward movement towards the promise and the prize that is set before us. It isn't the devil that he's saying to lay aside. It's the stuff that we've been willing to grab onto. The question is, will we cast aside? Will we lay it aside? Will we get unstuck from the place that we are? And I believe today there's going to be a grace to get unstuck from the things that you and I have been holding on to. If you believe that online and in the room, can you say amen? amen? If you have your Bibles, let's turn to our main text of Numbers chapter 14. Let me give us a quick context to this in case you're not aware. God gave Abraham a promise of a, of, of, of a land that he would give his descendants. A few generations later, Israel finds themselves in Egypt, rescued initially, but now, now are in a place of enslavement and oppression. They've grown from just a small family now to, say, a million or two million people, grown into a, a, to a, a, a massive body, yet they're enslaved and oppressed, far from the land of promise that they had. God sends a guy named Moses. Moses, through his action with, the, with, with, with Israel, frees them from their place of slavery. They go to Mount Sinai, this place in the wilderness where they covenant and become a legit nation, and then he leads them into this place of just coming to the edge of their promised land. They spend about a year in Sinai, and now they've moved from it. Here they are on the precipice, 400 years in enslaved, uh, in, 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 in enslaved condition, now a year covenanting, and now here they are, about to grab hold of, to lay hold of what can be. And Moses sends into this, into this unknown land for them 12 spies. Ten of them come back and say, nah, doc, they big in there, big ones. Hard ones, we, 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 we should not go there. And two, Joshua and Caleb said, no, 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 no. We got this one. 
Come on, God is with us. We can, we can do this. And it's in that moment in response that we find ourselves, Israel staring at the promised land, uh, the, the giants that would be in the land, having to say whose report will you believe in. Numbers 14 is where we find ourselves. Verse 1, then all the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept that night. And all the people, verse 2 of Israel, grumbled or complained or murmured, depending upon your translation, against Moses and Aaron. We'll come back to that verse in a moment. Would not the whole, whole congregation then said to them, would it be better had we died in the land of Egypt? Or would we have died here in this wilderness? Why is the Lord bringing us into a land only to kill us? Our wives and little ones would become prey. Let's go back to Egypt. Verse 4, what a statement. Then Moses and Aaron fell prostrate before them in a context of intercession. Verse 6, Joshua and Caleb say, no, 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 uh, we, we can do this. They tore their clothes in anguish over the fear that is present in the complaint that is coming out. And they said, the land which we pass through, verse 7, is exceedingly good. Verse 8, if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land. Only, verse 9, do not rebel against God. Do not fear them, for they are bread for us, meaning they are our provision. We can handle this, for the Lord is with us. Verse 10, then all the congregation, they didn't like that, picked up stones to kill them all. And it says, but the glory of the Lord appeared, his manifest presence at the tent of meeting. Three lessons that we learn from being stuck. Now it's this response that then keeps, as we'll look, an entire generation out of the promised land, stuck and dying in the wilderness. Three lessons that we learn to not do to move into our Canaan land. First is we gotta tame our tongue. The third is we must guard our ears. And thirdly, we must redefine the promise. If you're taking notes, write this down. The first step to get unstuck is tame your tongue. There is nothing in our lives that has a greater influence on our forward movement toward the promises of God than the words that proceed from our mouth. Show me the content of your mouth. Show me the content of your emails. Show me the content of your text messages. Show me the content of your social media posts. And I will discern for you where you are in your stuckness and your promise. And don't kid yourselves. Just because it's electronic on social media, texting, and email, it counts too. That post you put created a spiritual atmosphere that you are living in. Just because you didn't verbally say it, it counts. And if we were to evaluate all of that... If we were to look at all of these things, it will just show us, display for us where we are towards our promised land. The Old Testament reiterates time and time and time again, it was Israel's complaint and the words from their mouth that kept them out of what they could have had. From the moment of Exodus uh, uh, from Egypt all the way to this moment, 14 different times Israel complains against God. And every time there's a restriction, there is a judgment or a backwards movement towards what God has for them in the promised land. Nothing greater than the words from our mouth influence this. Look at our text, verse 1. Then all of the congregation raised a loud cry, and the people wept. We'll come back to this premise. And all the people of Israel, verse 2, grumbled, complained, murmured, accused God and leadership, Moses and Aaron. I found this to be intriguing to me. Prior to this moment of complaint, they're expressing some fear and worry. They're, they're, they're expressing, uh, how, God, how are you going to do this? I find, can I make a pastoral comment here? This is, this is fully and wholly right to express the concerns of our heart to God. There's a whole section of Psalms I talk about often called the book of lament. The Psalms of lament, excuse me. A whole book called Lamentations. The process of describing to God our disappointments, our fears, our worry, our doubts is a healthy thing. David, man, did this all the time. 
It's when our words turn from expressing our heart's issues to God to complaining and accusation towards others that judgment comes. There is a difference between complaining and holy lament, and it is mostly is it horizontal and accusing rather vertical and heart expression. And so when they're simply expressing fear, there's no judgment. There's a grace, I believe, for Israel to express their concerns. Judgment to a whole generation only comes when it turns accusatory and horizontal. And the words of our mouth towards others about God and other people then determine whether or not I can move and he can deal with my fear or I'm stuck in the wilderness forever. Here's, here's a note that struck my heart. Why is this such a big deal? Why is it this way? Because complaining is in direct opposition to heaven's work. The biblical narrative from the Old Testament history books to the, to the wisdom literature, to the Psalms, to the Gospels, to the epistles is this. The words that you speak from your mouth create a spiritual atmosphere that the promise of God de- develops in or dies in. It's a text I'm sure you're aware of, Proverbs 18, 21. The power of, excuse me, death and life and the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat of its fruits. The writer here, I believe, seems to suggest that you will eat of the fruit of death or eat of the fruit of life, depending upon which you plant. And that is the words from your mouth. This word life that the writer in Proverbs uses is the same Hebrew word that describes God himself as being a living God. It's the same word in the Genesis account when it says God spoke and life emerged. Here is the premise. The very life that is in the power of life to emerge life from from that which we speak is put in your mouth when you speak it in alignment with God. Now, come on, I'm not talking about blab it and grab it and name it and claim it. Throw that joker in the trash can. I am talking about an alignment of our tongue to the promises that God has spoken. James would say that you have a massive ship that's your life and his promises. And the thing that directs its destination is a small little rudder on the back that he calls the tongue. And it doesn't matter how big the wind is, how big the ship is, if that rudder, your tongue, is not in alignment with where the promises are, your ship ain't getting there. The power of life and death is in your confession in alignment to the promises of God. My sense, someone online, you've got a journal and you've got all kinds of promises that God has woven into your life. I just see a pages and pages and pages and I hear God saying, begin to speak in alignment with those promises, not just your circumstances. You see, it's life it's alignment with heaven. Paul writing in Philippians would say something similar. Philippians chapter 2, he'd say, you're unified with Christ. Because you're one with him, have his mind, think his thoughts. Walk in humility and service with him. And then thirdly, this is what he would say, do all things without complaining. You know what all things means in the Greek? Catch it. Ready, 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 ready. All things. <laughs> Come on, Greek scholars, all things. Why? It, it's connected to the nature and the character of Christ. We don't see him complaining in the garden. We see him saying, it's going to be really hard. Can I have this? And I, it's, it's as if the dialogue, the father said, no, 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 this is the plan. He says, okay, then my will, your will, not mine. You see, when we complain, we fly in the face of what God would have for us. You see, what we speak shapes what we see. It was Israel's complaint that caused them to see the giants in the land greater than their God. Non-complaining doesn't deny the giants. It just says, I know what it's going to take. And here Israel's complaint drove a wedge between them and the promise and caused them to be stuck where they were. The last three or four years for my family and I, man, we, we, we had some ups and downs. Had some weird health stuff. We've had some financial stuff. 
We've had a ministry journey in our life that has been as unknown as I've ever known it to be. And I thought I was doing pretty good through it. I thought I was managing okay, like through all the unknowns and the storms and the things left. And I, I got to know this pastor about the last year and a half or so. He's out on the West Coast. And we talk quite often. And uh, the other day we we're talking and I'm saying blah, 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 blah. I think I'm wholly lamenting. I'm fleshly complaining. And this is what he says to me. He says, well, if you weren't frustrated, you just wouldn't be Joel. <laughs> like a Holy Spirit sniper took me out. Assuredly, that's not the content of my heart that is speaking that kind of complaining and frustration. I tried to like dodge it. It was like Mike Tyson's knockout totally took me out. Holy Spirit said, no, no, no. Do you hear this? Your friend from another coast has hurt you enough to know you are complaining too much. Shut your mouth. I, here's the crazy thing about complaining sometimes. Sometimes you do it so much you don't even know you're doing it. And it takes somebody else, as we'll talk about, to say, this isn't how this works. You see, I had to work through an evaluation with Holy Spirit of the content of my words to find out I've got more complaint than lament happening. I've got more speaking death than speaking life. And here's my question for us today. What and how are the content of your words creating the stuck environment that you're in? So homework assignment number one, evaluate your conversation. Some of y'all got to go through your text messages. Some of y'all got to do a Facebook history post. Go back through and ask for all your things you put on there. Ask a friend, as we'll talk about. Phone a friend. How have I been talking lately? But it is incumbent upon us to ferociously evaluate the content of our words. And this week, find your way to a quiet place. Go on a walk, sit in a car, go get a cup of coffee somewhere, and sit and you and Holy Spirit deal with the words from your mouth. But it's not just about taming the tongue. It's about guarding your ears. This is also what we see in our text, that complaining is always in a, a community affair. Complaining loves company. Look at what it says in verse 4. Then they said to one another. Complaining has a momentum not on its own accord. It gains a momentum when it's shared to others. There is a horizontal nature to complaining that creates an environment that you then start complaining yourself. Complaining never stays in a vacuum. It finds legs. It's like a, it's like a superpower that grows with other people. And the more ears you get to your complaining, the stronger it takes. And all of a sudden, you're an entire nation stuck in the wilderness because you have entertained and shared in the complaint at your job, in your family, in your place. And one of the ways we get unstuck is not just our own mouths, but we guard our ears. And there are some holy goodbyes we need to offer others because they just complain too much. You know in your office who's the complainer. You know in your schoolroom who's the complainer. And it's okay to say, I don't have time for this. Now don't be mean. Do it with a smile. Give them a gift card. But say, I can't do this no more. Because when I'm with you, my mouth changes. Now listen, if the complainer in your life is your spouse, you stuck with that. If they, they, if they your blood or put a ring on your finger, you got to intercede like Moses. But if it ain't that, come on, your promised land is not worth you entertaining a conversation that's not holy. What I also found, though, is when I stop giving my ear to the complainer, they stop coming around. There's some holy knows I ain't got to say. I just, I'm, I'm busy. I'm sorry. I can't handle this. Or don't reply. Or block. All that works. It isn't worth it. And we must guard our ears from the conversation around us. 
Because we will entertain things that keep us stuck and out of the Canaan land. It took a friend who would say to me, finally, this ain't working for me. You know, I've said this before, but it's true. You know, the power of being deceived is that you're deceived. If you knew that you were deceived, you wouldn't be deceived. And sometimes it takes someone else to say, you got stuff coming out of your mouth that you can't hear, but I'm telling you, it's wrong. And he said, I won't have it anymore. It was enough to wake me up and say, okay, I must course correct my rudder in order to get to where I want to get to. Who's the relationship that you know needs to end this week? The conversation that needs to stop. Has your office become a breeding ground for complaint? And maybe it's time to shut the door. Online, it's real quiet in here. Is it that quiet in your living room? <laughs> Guard your ears. Turn to somebody and you're right. Say, I'm going to guard my ears. But you can still talk to me. Lastly, as we finish today, it's not just about guarding our ears and taming our tongue, but maybe even more fundamental to those two things, we must redefine the promise. Israel's primary identity was not that they were Enslaved in Egypt, their primary identity was not that they were lost in the wilderness or found in the wilderness. Their primary identity wasn't even that they were in the land of Canaan that God said prior. Their promise was this, that they were the people of God's presence. Their promise, their identity was that he would be with them no matter where they were. Let's get it straight. God ushers Multiple generations before this to Abraham, all kinds of promise of land and people and, and descendants. And he says this, but let's get this straight, Abraham. I am your exceedingly great reward, not the promise. Not the land, not the people, not the blessings. I am. My presence is the promised land. Wherever his presence is, enslaved, lost in the wilderness, or established in your place of promise, his presence is it. And until his presence is enough, the promised land never will be. Moses, looking on before this in the book of Exodus, says this to God, unless your presence goes with us. Do not send us into the promised land. For how will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight except that you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all of the rest of the people on the face of the earth. You see, you don't get unstuck in your promised land. You get unstuck in the wilderness when you realize that his presence is enough. Because the truth is you can be in your promised land and as Pastor Dana shared last week, make the promised land your idol and be, and be exceptionally disappointed if his presence isn't the promise. Let me help us for a minute. That relationship that you're in right now, that's the fifth one in the journey, is just as unhealthy and not fulfilling because you've made the relationship status the promised land, not his presence. That educational track you're on, those, those letters after your name, 37 degrees up to your debt, eye, eyeballs in debt, still isn't, isn't sufficient for your heart and life. Why? Because you've made the educational thing the promised land, the job at the university the promised land, not his presence. That ministry that you want to launch that, that no longer is, is sufficient for your heart and life and you're in the rut, like you're stuck in the tunnel on the way to Hampton. The reason why that is not enough is because you've made the ministry the promised land, not his presence. And until we get that clear in our hearts and in our souls, we will always be stuck, whether in Canaan, in Egypt, or the wilderness. And we jump from place to place to place, wondering why isn't the promised land enough? Because the problem is the promised land was never the promise. His presence was. And the grace to get unstuck is found in redefining what our end goal is.
we were in this journey about two years deep. We were in between homes, wife and I and family, really unsure of what would transpire with school, with our kids, and ministry at the church and things. And uh, we're living in Sandbridge at a rental house, and I'm looking out over the water, and I have this vision in my mind's eye, not like real life, but in my mind's eye. I see this pillar of cloud. In the Old Testament, Moses recounts this, that God's manifest presence would come in the form of a cloud by day and fire by night. And when the cloud or fire would move, they would move. And when the, when the cloud and fire would stay, they would stay because his presence was the gig. I'm looking out over the water and I see this pillar. It's a cloud. It's now moving. It's resolute. And all around it, I see these storms just raging, winds blowing. Now, I'm not a cloudologist. Is that a thing? But my general sense, if the wind is blowing, all the clouds should be going in a general same direction. And, and, and yet in this vision, this cloud remained. This, this pillar stayed. And I saw like category kind of four and five winds blowing all around it. And yet it, it would not move. And I said, Lord, what am I looking at? And he said, this is the cloud of my presence. And, 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 and as I saw the winds blowing, I felt all the frustrations in my heart to not move with the clouds. Because it's like a ship, right? When the wind blows, put the sails up and go where you're going. And the longer you got to stay, when the cloud isn't moving, but the winds are around you, the, the more frustrated you can get. And I, I, I sensed my own soul wanting to go with where the clouds are going. Yet, yet, yet the pillar hadn't moved. I heard the Lord say, Do not let the clouds of your circumstance drive you from where my presence is. He said, Joel, I don't care where the cloud leads you, the clouds, the storms. If my presence isn't there, it ain't worth it. Just remain where the presence is. Family, if his presence isn't in the relationship, don't walk through that door. If his presence isn't in that business deal, don't go through it. If his presence isn't in the ministry, don't try and apply for it. If the presence isn't in the educational track, the drill, whatever it is, don't go there because it's not the promised land. Only his presence is. And my sense is this morning, here and at home, we've been too easily driven by the winds around us. And it's time to say, unless your presence goes, I ain't going with it. Because your presence and my hunger and thirst for your presence of where you are, this is who I am. This is my identity, not promised land, not Jerusalem, not Babylon, not Egypt. It's your presence. And if I got that, it is enough. Where? Have you made your promised land an idol? And where is it time to lay it down and re-seek the presence and the cloud to find the real fulfillment of your heart and life? Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we ask now that you'd make us into a people of your presence who can not just discern where your cloud is, but have the resolution to stick with it. And yes, might there be a grace on every lips to speak truth in love, to confess rightly, guard our ears, but make this a house, make this a place where like Moses, we say, show us your glory. Your presence is what we seek. And bring us, yes, into the promised land, but bring us into the fullness of of your spirit. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, I hope that you enjoyed our sermon today. I hope that you were inspired and challenged. And maybe you have a question about something that you heard in the message today, or maybe you need prayer. We would love to take the time to pray with you and answer any questions that you might have. 
All you need to do is simply send us an email to online at newlife.global and we would love to connect with you. Well, be sure to subscribe to our channel. You should see the link right over here somewhere and turn those notifications on. That way you are notified every single time we go live on YouTube. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful week and we'll see you on the next video. Take care. Oh, 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 oh,